Mary and Martha, you know, one of the, I suppose, most famous couples in the Bible would be Mary and Martha. Very famous and I think very stereotypical, at least within the, the core of Bible students. But that I mean that Mary, well, Mary and Martha are almost extremes and, and parody is, is extremes of characteristics and the truth. Martha, a deeply practical woman, warm, officious, bustling, somewhat impetuous perhaps, but often characterised as really having just very little time for spiritual things. On the other hand, Mary would be characterised as a more retiring sort, thoughtful, meditative, deeply spiritual, but really not in the least bit practical. And so you can see these, these two sisters often would be characterised as one of spirituality, the other of service, and almost never the twain shall meet. Well, no doubt those characterizations are generally true, but not really that accurate. There's no question Martha is a more practical sort and Mary is a more spiritual support, uh, sort. But to suppose that Martha wasn't spiritual or, or that in some way Mary wasn't practical would be to go too far. I'll show you what I mean. Look at verse 39 of Luke chapter 10. Martha, it tells us, had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now, what do you think it means when it says also sat at Jesus' feet? But what it means, very simply, she, she sat at Jesus' feet in addition to helping in the kitchen, which was where Martha was in this particular section. Martha, on the other hand, wasn't just practical without spirituality. She's spoken of in John 11 and verse 5 with Mary and Lazarus as having one of the greatest commendations you could ever receive, that they were beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus wouldn't have loved Martha in this manner if she'd had no time at all for spiritual things. So I think that makes the point. Whilst Martha was inclined to be more practical and Mary was inclined to be more spiritual, it would be wrong to say that Martha was only practical and Mary was only spiritual. Do you know, I think the real situation, you might think about it like this, Mary and Martha, I think, are really the counterparts of Peter and John, the disciples, Peter and John. Now you think of that, Peter, the more forthright, more energetic, more active disciple, a leader of unquestionable ability, a practical man. John, more retiring, more thoughtful, with a much sharper spiritual perception, it appears, than Peter. When the Lord wanted an opinion from the disciples, who spoke first? It was always Peter that spoke first. But when both of those two, Peter and John, ran to the tomb, who was it that realised what had happened? John 20 verse 8 tells us that John went in also and he saw and believed. So he had a keener spiritual insight than Peter did. Both men, however, were spiritual because they were both disciples. Both men were practical because they were both fishermen. But one had a strength in one area and the other had a strength in another. And it was the same with these two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha appear, as it turns out, in three separate scriptural records. They appear here, obviously, at the end of Luke chapter 10. We meet them the next time in John 11 at the funeral of Lazarus. And we meet them finally in John chapter 12, where Mary would anoint the Lord's feet with spikenard. Only those three records. And we're going to look at each of those three, one after the other this morning. But if you want the epitome of the difference between these two sisters, I think you can do no better than this. In each of those three records, and you can see them here, we've got Luke 10, John 11, John 12 on the screen. And in each of those three records, you read the characteristics of the two sisters. If I look down the left-hand column, Martha in Luke 10 was cumbered out with much serving. She's on her feet. In John 11, it tells us that Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was come, went and met him. She's on her feet again. 
And in John 12 and verse 2, they made a supper and Martha served. She's on her feet. And in contrast, Mary, Luke 10 verse 39, she's at Jesus' feet. In John 11 and verse 32, when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. She's at the Lord's feet again. And then in John 12 and verse 3, the final record, Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. She's at the Lord's feet again. So Martha's on her feet. Mary's at the Lord's feet in each of the three records in which each of these two sisters appear. So that might characterize the the predominant difference between them. But to say that Martha only served and Mary only studied would be to go too far for each of these two sisters, as I said. But there you are. There's, the, if you like, the biblical difference or the point that the Bible makes, the point of difference that the Bible makes between these two sisters. And that's, I think, the real clue to the characters of each of them, to the strengths of each of them. Yet they were both beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. But each had their special ability in the service of the truth. Well, Martha means lady or mistress. And in every sense, she was the lady of the house and certainly the lady of this house. It tells us in Luke 10 and verse 38, at the end of the verse, it says, Martha received the Lord into her house. Her house, it says. In Mark chapter 11 and verse, sorry, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 3, this house that they live in is called the house of Simon the leper. Simon was presumably Martha's husband because it's now evidently her house. And we would presume from that that Simon has now died, perhaps of leprosy. Their house was in Bethany, which is located about two miles from Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. Martha lived there with her sister Mary and with their brother Lazarus. And from the fact that Martha's name is usually mentioned first in the biblical record, we might infer that she was the eldest of the three siblings. Mary, on the other hand, her name means bitter. It's from the Old Testament, Mara or Miriam. And it was an extremely common name, as it turns out, in New Testament times. It would appear there are at least six different Marys in the New Testament record. But this Mary was unique. In John chapter 12, she's going to anoint the Lord's feet with ointment, as we have already found, which the Lord says will make her famous. That act would make her famous. In fact, it's Matthew's record that puts the point together. In Matthew 26 and verse 13 Wherever this gospel shall be preached in all the world, this shall also be spoken, it says, of what this woman hath done and be told as a memorial for her. So for, for 2,000 years since Mary did that deed in John 12, no one of faith has ever forgotten what she did. But, you know, there was a bitterness in the life of this Mary. She was the more discerning of the pair in spiritual things, as we've mentioned, the more perceptive, but her greatest strength turned out to be her greatest weakness. And that ability she had took its emotional toll. She was a much more demonstrative person, it appears, than Martha, a more emotional person, both in joy and in sorrow. So if emotionally Martha wandered along like this, Mary was like this. Great highs and great lows. And so she could soar to heights, but of course would also descend to death, says almost the counterbalance of that. She weeps, for instance, at the death of Lazarus in John 11 and verse 33. Martha never does. Martha doesn't cry. Now, perhaps she did, but there's no record of her crying at her brother's death in John chapter 11. But there is of Mary. She anoints the Lord for his burial in John chapter 12. Martha never does. So there are great differences between these two, you see. Mary, the more emotional, the more studious of the pair. What that means, then, is that when Bibles are opened, 
she can string verses together like this and make the Bible sing. And when she does that, she carries her sister Martha along with her. But when ecclesial trials come, when life descends into difficult times, she goes to pieces. Things become so sad. Things become so very, very sad. And when that happens, Martha picks her up and carries her along. And so that in many ways, these two sisters reflect the two major dimensions of ecclesial life. Each of them necessary. Both of them present somewhere, some more or some less in each one of us. So you think about this, how this might work in your own ecclesia. You know, there are people who have a verse for everything, who, who study carefully to find out the reason for everything. And you might wrestle with an issue and you go to them and you come away with a solution and a biblical principle to buttress it. Well, that would be a Mary. But there's another kind of person in ecclesial life. This is where the interested friend walks in the door. And before the interested friend has made it to the first or the, the last, like the back row of the hall, they're already arm in arm with this person. They just have a knack of going up to people and welcoming them and people just open up to them. Well, that would be a Martha. And sometimes, you know, Mary types marry Martha types. I've seen the situation in our own ecclesia where there might be a, a tour group of Christadelphians coming and a bus pulls up outside the front door of the ecclesial hall and it's a tour group of Christadelphians from Australia, maybe. But the bus has got the wrong ecclesia. They weren't meant to be here and no one knew. And there's a sister that looks around and sees 20 or 30 people walk in the door and she says, they'll be needing to go somewhere for a meal. And she leans over to her husband and says, on the way home, best you go via the pizza shop. Oh, what for? Now, the husband, of course, he's still trying to work out what that verse was that the exhorting brother mentioned but didn't give the quote for. Oh, oh, like this, you know. She says, yeah, yeah, we'll need pizzas. Ah, oh, ah, oh, uh, Matthew chapter 20, pizzas. Uh, how many pizzas done? Oh, 40. Oh, oh. And, and you can see this happen in ecclesial life. One, the more practical, the other more studious. But the balance works together, you see. And so it was in this family. Well, what's happening here in Luke chapter 10? Well, it tells us in verse 38, now it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him, that is the Lord and his company, into her house. It tells us that it came to pass as they went. Well, they're on the, they're on the Jericho Road between Jerusalem and Bethany. And it's interesting because, you know, in the previous verses before verse 38, the Lord has just given the parable of the Good Samaritan, which concluded with the question of neighborliness. How do you be a good neighbor? And in verse 34 of the parable, it says that he went to him, and that is the Samaritan, went to the, uh, the troubled man and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So it, it, it's very simplest application. This verse is an exhortation to provide for the material needs when others have a need. Well, the very next thing Luke records after the conclusion of that parable, of course, is this little visit to the house of Mary, Martha and Lazarus in Bethany. And the lesson of this story from verse 38 to 42 is to keep the provision of material needs in their right perspective. Because as you can see in this story, we've got material, material needs balanced against spiritual needs. And so it forms quite a good contrast with an extreme, if you like, interpretation of the, of the lesson of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, it tells us furthermore in verse 38 that they go into this village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. The word received literally means to admit under one's roof for entertainment or for hospitality. You can picture the scene. It's a wealthy house. Obviously, we know that because the spike nard of John chapter 12 that Mary had was very costly. So the family's 
a family of some means. But there's a height of activity. They're expecting the Lord to come with the 12. So Martha's, Mary and Martha are preparing to feed, you know, 15 more or more people on this occasion. And there's a knock at the door. The door bursts open and there she is in all her glory standing in the doorway. And if my picture is correct, probably occupying most of the door frame. It's Martha, the lady of the house, beaming from ear to ear. Oh, she says, welcome home. And you can just imagine Martha standing and greeting the Lord as he was want, as she was wont to do, because obviously he was wont to go to Bethany when he travelled to Jerusalem. Well, verse 39 tells us that Martha had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Also, as we said, implying that the fact that, well, that Mary had up until this moment also been busy in the kitchen. There was a practical dimension to Mary's life. But as soon as the Lord arrives, she leaves the kitchen and migrates to the lounge room with the disciples and the Lord to sit at Jesus' feet to hear what he had to say. Now, that's further reinforced in verse 40 because Martha's complaint in verse 40 is that my sister has left me to serve alone. Bid her, therefore, get out of the lounge room, get back into the kitchen and help me. We're trying to prepare a meal and things aren't going well. So you can see clearly what must have happened here. Well, Mary sat, it says in verse 39, at the Lord's feet. And the Lord began to teach. And it tells us that she wanted to hear his word, as verse 39 says. And, of course, there's an enormous Old Testament precedent for this. Because to sit at someone's feet was the regular custom of students to teachers. I mean, Acts chapter 22 and verse 3 tells us that the Apostle Paul, recalling his upbringing, says that he verily was a, was a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. So it was a common thing, you see, for students to sit at the feet of renowned teachers. Well, they've got the greatest teacher in the world sitting in the lounge room at this very moment, and Mary can't miss the opportunity. But of course, Acts 22, the example that Paul illustrates in Acts 22 is based on a great Old Testament precedent. And that's the precedent of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 33. This is the blessing, Deuteronomy 33 verse 1, wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai. He loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. You see, you see Moses, speaking of the kingdom age, talks about the saints sitting at the Lord's feet to receive of his words. Well, that's precisely what's happening here. That's what Mary is doing here in verse 39 of Luke chapter 10. What do you think the Lord was talking about, by the way? Well, I think it's very likely he was elaborating on, his, on an explanation of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because, you see, I think, well, I think a word or two might have gone through the door from the lounge room to the kitchen and it caused Martha to respond because her response in verse 40 is, does there not care that my sister's left me to serve alone. Well, it's interesting because the parable of the Good Samaritan in many ways is all about care. You'll see the word care appears in verse 34. He took care of him. It appears again in verse 35, take care of him. And so if the Lord was repeating this parable, you can imagine, to the 12 gathered around him and to Mary and perhaps Lazarus in this lounge room, and that word filtered through to the kitchen. And there's a sister there in the kitchen in a bit of a panic. And they're talking all about care. And she's thinking all about care. Dost thou not care that my sister has left me here to serve alone? 
I'm speculating, but it's a very great possibility in the immediate context of that parable that the disciples press the Lord for a more detailed explanation of the parable and they receive it very possibly at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ in the house in Bethany. Well, verse 40 tells us that Martha, whilst all this was happening, Martha was cumbered about much serving. And she came to the Lord and said, Lord, dost thou not care that sister hath left me alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. You can imagine how that was going to occur. The Lord would be explaining the exposition he was giving. You have a lounge room of people in rapt attention listening to him. But in the next room, in the kitchen, things weren't really going very well at all. There's a lot of pots on the boil. She's cooking for a lot of people. She's trying to manage the order of the food preparation, trying to keep things warm. She reaches for this pan and perhaps thinks better of it and, that, and, and knocks down a saucepan from the top. And now the white sauce needs stirring and the potatoes are beginning to boil dry and she can't remember, remember where she's put salt in them. And did Mary do that or didn't Mary do that? And where were, exactly were we up to and what are they talking about now? And, and, and <laughs> turns to the lounge room bursts in care. Don't you care that I'm out here? The cheese in there. Totally get out of there. Come back here and do what we were doing. It was all going so well till you came. Well, you, you can imagine the consternation in Martha's voice. The record says that she was cumbered about much serving. The word mean, the word cumbered about means to drag around or to drag around in many directions. The New English Bible says Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she's trying to multitask and do a lot of things all at once and it's not going well. And she's planned this meal. It was a very special meal for a very special group. And she thought about how, just how it would work and just what order things would be done in. And now everything's going to be ruined. And it's Mary's fault. And in a flash of anger, she flings open the door and admonishes the Lord in verse 40. Well, there's a problem, of course, in all of this. There is a problem. Bid her, therefore, Martha says. Bid her, therefore. Tell her to get back in here and help me. And she tells him off. Well, you know, if this had been Nicodemus, the Lord might well have met fire with fire. He did so, you remember, in John chapter 3. Men love darkness, Nicodemus. And as Nicodemus scuttles out of the Lord's house at some time after midnight, in the black of night, down the road into darkness, men love darkness, the Lord says, because their deeds are evil. Why didn't you come to me in broad daylight, Nicodemus? Well, he doesn't do that here. It's very different. Jesus answered in verse 41, Martha, Martha. They are careful and troubled about many things, Martha. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. J.B. Phillips translation. You are worried and bothered about so many things. The New English Bible again. You are fretting and fussing about many things, he says. And notice the contrast between verses 41 and 42. Many things at the end of verse 41. One thing at the commencement of verse 42. Well, what was the one thing needful? Well, you've got it here. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3 really puts the Old Testament principle right on the mark. Thou shalt remember all the way which Yahweh thy God led thee these 40 years says Moses, that he humbled thee, he suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, and neither did thy fathers know. Why? That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Yahweh doth man live. And that's the point. Natural food isn't the only kind of food, and it's not the most needful kind of food, as it turns out. But here's the interesting thing. 
just hold Luke chapter 11 and come with me to Luke chapter 24. I'm going to compare Luke 11, verse 42, with Luke 24, verse 42. It says in Luke 24, verse 42, after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And you see that word peace in verse 42 of Luke 24, the piece of broiled fish, it's the same Greek word as the one, or sorry, as the good part of Luke 11 in verse 42. So I could read verse, 11, uh, verse 42 of Luke 11. Mary has chosen that good piece or that good part which shall not be taken from her. And that good part in Luke 24 verse 42 was a piece of food. So you see the point. There are two meals being prepared in the house of Bethany. One in the kitchen, the other in the lounge room. And the meal of the lounge room is the more important of the two. And Martha hadn't appreciated that. Hadn't appreciated the significance just of what her sister had done and the significance which her sister understood. But let me show you how serious this is. Come with me to John chapter 4. We're finished in Luke 10. So come to John 4 as we journey across eventually to John 11. John 4 is the story of the woman of Samaria. And instantly you might know the point I'm going to make here. Because look at John 4 and verse 7. Here's the real power of what Jesus told Martha in Luke 10. In John 4 and verse 7, it says that there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy food. So they're going shopping for lunch. Well, one thing leads to another. And the Lord has this discussion of, with the woman of Samaria. And she's very responsive. And so she's going to go back to the city of Samaria and bring out all the city to come and see or to come and see the man that told me all things that ever I did. Well, by and by, the disciples also return with the food. In verse 31, it says, In the meanwhile, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. And he said to them in verse 32, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And therefore, have said the disciples to one another, Has any man brought him? Ought to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Can you see what's happened? He says, I've just made another convert. I'm already satisfied. I'm no longer hungry. I was hungry before. I'm no longer hungry. Can you see the point? Back in Luke chapter 10, Martha's coming about by so much activity in the kitchen, and it may appear that the Lord's not even hungry. And she's doing all this for him when, in fact, Mary has given him more satisfaction in the lounge room than Martha ever could have given him in the kitchen. I have meat that ye know not of, he says. And in the case of John chapter 4, he tells them, I'm no longer hungry. But thanks anyway. It's remarkable, isn't it? It's remarkable. And so the point is that Martha had made a mistake, a mistake in priorities. We all need to eat, so we all need to prepare food, but there is one thing more needful even than that. And the problem that Martha had was that she had elevated the practical things beyond their rightful place. And it's an easy thing to do. And, of course, in life it's a difficult balance to strike, often a very difficult balance to strike particularly for busy people. I mean, it's often a a problem for busy people to say no. That's why they're busy. But here's the thing. If you never say no, all you do is the practical things. And at some point before long, you run out of hours in a day. And if you say yes to too many things, and all of a sudden things take longer than you expected, where do you get the time from? Well, it often means you take the time from your family. And don't deliver the needful thing to your family in your effort to satisfy the needs of others. 
So it becomes an important point then for practical people to learn when to say no, to take on enough obligations to fill the time, but do them properly. Because that's the other thing that happens. If you do say yes to too many things and you take too much on and, and they take longer than you expect, you don't do anything properly. And then you let down the people who first asked you that you committed to. And so practical things are necessary, but practical things are going to be kept in their place. And we can't rob spiritual things to do practical things. And, and that would be, of course, the lesson of Luke chapter 10. Well, John chapter 11 is the next event in the life of these two sisters. This, of course, is the death of Lazarus and the events that happened around it. It tells us in John chapter 11 and verse 1 that a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary which had anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. But that's interesting, you know, because verse 2 tells us that it was going to be Mary that anointed the Lord's feet with ointment. Now, that doesn't happen. That anointing does not actually occur until the very next chapter. And so verse 2, therefore, is written in anticipation of an event that's going to happen in John chapter 12. Now, of course, John is writing all of these events, all these chapters long after the events occurred. So he's at liberty to do this. Why, however, are we told this in verse 2? And I think the answer is because if Luke chapter 10 showed Martha in a bad light, John chapter 11 is going to show the weakness of Mary. It's going to expose the weakness that Mary had. And the point of this comment in verse 2 is don't judge Mary too badly for what you see her do in John chapter 11. Don't judge her too harshly for that. After all, she does know Christ is going to die. And she does, it appears, see a significance in the death of Lazarus as we're not that many months away from the final Passover of the Lord's, of the Lord's life. Well, that said, it goes on in verse 5 and tells us that Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. So this is said because what Jesus appears to do now is the very opposite of loving this family. He's going to let Lazarus die. And so we're told in verse 5 that, in fact, he does love the family, and the reason that he lets Lazarus die is to teach a lesson. Well, verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that Lazarus was sick, the Lord abode two days still in the same place where he was. He doesn't immediately come. And as I say, that's why verse 5 is given us. This was still an act of love, despite the fact that it didn't appear to be. Well, verse 19, <coughs> the Lord finally comes back to Bethany. And it tells us in verse 19 that many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother, because, of course, Lazarus had now died. They were a wealthy family, many of the religious elite from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's only a couple of miles away, remember. They had come to the funeral. And then Martha, verse 20. As soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary sat in the house. So there she is. It's Martha. Up and off. Practical things need to be done. No time for sitting around. But look at Mary in verse 20. She's paralysed, isn't she? She's paralysed, overcome with grief, doesn't have an explanation for what's occurred to her brother. Why did the Lord delay for so long? He wasn't that far away. Perhaps it's a symbol of his own death. Oh, what are we going to do, Martha, when he dies? How will we survive? Oh, it's so sad. And you can see she can't move in verse 20. And you see the more... Spiritual, the more sensitive, the more emotional personality wilting under the grief of the occasion. She's completely out of commission. But Martha, her sister, has taken charge, not insensitively, but she will manage the situation. She's not victim to the same emotions that Mary is, at least not in the same way. And so in verse 21, then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, Lord, 
If they had been here, my brother had not died. Now, how many times do you think the pair of them, Mary and Martha, had said that? If only the Lord was here. Why isn't he here? How come he's taking so long? He must have gone back 50 times, 100 times between the pair of them. Because look at verse 32. When Mary was come, where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if they had been here, my brother had not died. She said exactly the same thing that Martha said. So clearly the two sisters had said this back and forth many, many times. If only the Lord was here. If only he was here. Well, now Martha appeals to the Lord in verse 22. And she says, but I know, Lord, that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus says to her in verse 23, Martha, thy brother's going to rise again. Oh, yes, she says, I know he's going to rise again at the resurrection. No, no, says Jesus. No, no, I'm not talking about the resurrection. In verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. That is to say, I control the grave, but not just in that day. I control the grave in this day. I don't have to wait to the kingdom of God, Martha, to resurrect me from the grave. Do you believe that, Martha? That's what he says in verse 26. Do you believe me? Yes, I believe you, Lord, she says in verse 27. Okay. So now go and tell your sister. Verse 28. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, the master's come. And he calleth for thee. Well, in verse 30, Jesus is standing there. He hasn't gone to the house because there's too many people there. Instead, Mary comes out to him. In verse 32, the Lord doesn't explain anything to Mary. Don't explain anything to her. She already knew what was happening. But look at her. Look at her in verse 32. The words we just read. She's overcome, isn't she? And in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and he was troubled. It never says Martha wept. The professionals were weeping. Mary was weeping. But Mary has to learn a lesson here. She had to trust that the Lord knew what he was doing. And she had to learn something from re resilience of her sister, Martha. So John chapter 11 really doesn't paint Mary in a good light in the sense that she was completely incapacitated with grief. Whereas her more practical sister could manage this situation and carry her. So this is the opposite perspective then to uh, Luke chapter 10 where Mary shone in comparison to Martha. Well, all of that is brought together in John chapter 12 in the next page. John chapter 12 and verse 1, it tells us that Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he'd raised from the dead. And they made him a supper. And Martha served. Of course she did. Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Surprise, surprise. He's back at Bethany again and at supper time and Martha serving. But notice she's not cumbered about now with much serving. She just serves. There's no distraction. There's no fretting and fussing. She serves. Somebody's got to serve. She does it. But it, perhaps it's a more simple meal this time. But now it becomes very serious in verse 3. Then Mary, well, sorry, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. The Lord really will die in six days. It told us that in verse 1. Mary does the greatest thing she could do, and she anoints the Lord's feet in preparation for his death and burial. Look at verse 7. I mean, this anointing, of course, caused a great stir amongst the disciples. Judas Iscariot was chief in it. They, he complained that the money wasn't given to the poor. We know the reason for that. But in verse 7, it says, 
that Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she done this. For the poor, Judas, you were always going to have with you, but me you won't always have with you. So Mary anoints the Lord now. Why? Why does she anoint him now? Mary Magdalene had no problem anointing him after he was buried. Well, you've got the clue to that question. You see, understand the question. Why does Mary anoint the Lord a week before his death and burial? When a different Mary was able to anoint him after his death and burial, which would have been a more appropriate time to anoint him. That's what Nicodemus and Joseph of Marathia did. Well, come back with me to, jo to, to Mark chapter 14, because Mark explains this event and adds another detail. In Mark 14 and verse 6, Gospel of Mark chapter 14 and verse 6. Here's the same event. Here's Mark's parallel record to John chapter 12. Mark 14 verse 6, Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble you her? She has wrought a good work on me referring to the anointing. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever she, ye will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. And here's the key point that Mark makes that John doesn't make. She has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. She's done what she could. Why didn't she anoint him a week later? Because she couldn't do it. You'll recall the woman at the, feet of the, at the foot of the cross, Mary the Lord's mother, Mary Magdalene, Joanna. What about Mary of Bethany? Not there. Why not? Why not there? Jesus loved this family. Why wasn't she at the cross? She couldn't do it. She would have gone to pieces at the foot of the cross. She would have been paralysed at the foot of the cross. Could Martha have done it? Of course she could have. Where was Martha if she wasn't at the foot of the cross? Where do you think? She was at home with her sister, wasn't she? She was at home with her sister. So do you see the triumph of John chapter 12? Mary understands her strengths. She understands her weaknesses. And she prepares for that. She prepares for it. So she never intends to go to the crucifixion like many of the other women that did. Instead, she, she anoints the Lord and pays her last respects in the previous week because she couldn't have done what was required at the time. And Martha, who could have gone to the cross, I dare say, she only lived a couple of miles away. She could have gone to the cross with the other woman. She doesn't. She stays with her sister because her sister needs her. And in John chapter 12, everything comes together, you see. Mary understands her strengths and her weaknesses. Martha has put practical service in its right place, and she understands where she's needed in ecclesial life as well. And you've got the perfect balance now of spirituality and service comes together between these two sisters in the record of John chapter 12. Let me just, if I could beg another minute, show you one thing. Come with me to Proverbs chapter 31. You've got this remarkably well put. Now, you know Proverbs 31. And the reason I'm turning there, of course, is because this is the virtuous woman. And we've got two sisters who, between them, elaborate two great extremes, if you like, of ecclesial life, of spirituality and of service. Uh, the virtuous woman combines them both together. And look at this in Proverbs 31 and verse 26. The virtuous woman opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Now, this wisdom is the wisdom of God. Well, that would be Mary. She looketh well to the ways of her husband, of her household, verse 27, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Well, that would be Martha. 
And you see the virtuous woman has combined both characteristics in their right balance. In their right and proper place. And so what would the lesson be? Or the lessons be from the story of these two sisters? Well, the first one must be that Mary and Martha are presented in the record of, as the two dimensions of ecclesial service. One of spirituality and the other of practical service. And to a greater or lesser extent, these two sisters reflect every single one of us. We all have a predisposition one way or the other on this continuum. But there's a balance to be struck in all of this. And that applies equally to all of us. It's not good enough to say, I'm a Bible student and ignore the practicalities of ecclesial life. Equally, it's not good enough to say, I'm a practical sort of person and ignore Bible study. Both are necessary. Secondly, we do have to recognise our strengths and our weaknesses. We're not all good at everything. Some of us are good in some times and others excel at other times. Sometimes we need a Mary in our lives. Sometimes we need a Martha in our lives. And thanks be to God, that is precisely what we've given ecclesias for. Thanks, Brother Chairman.